Okay. Yep. Good morning. Good morning to everybody. Welcome to AmCham Cambodia's webinar, Hot Tax Dispute Issues and How to Solve Them. We're very fortunate this morning to be partnering with BDB Moy and somebody who's uh, well known in the market for tax issues, Mr. Edwin van der Bruggen. Hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, so this this should be a very informative uh, webinar. Tax issues. Uh, I think most of us are facing uh, challenges with uh, compliance with uh, tax issues as they're ever changing, as well as uh, dealing with audits, which is really I think we'll be focusing on today. It's uh, very much like your health. Uh, it's about prevention, uh, doing things compliant and right up front. So that when that time comes, when you have a tax audit, that you're clean and you're able to uh, to deal with the, an audit and get out without any uh, getting uh, bruised, I guess best put. Uh, and also, as as the tax uh, system here gets more complicated, as we're facing new regulations such as transfer of pricing, uh, the exemptions that are coming out and dealing with uh, whether you're exempt and state charges and there's salaries, uh, taxes for shareholders, a whole list of things we'll discuss today. So uh, we have the experts here uh, with BDB Lloyd, who's been in the market a very long time and well known. And I'm going to hand it over to them. We're going to have a series of uh, speeches or, or presentations, best put, and we will hold questions until after those presentations are done and then when we will answer those presentations. The presentations we expect to last about 30 to 40 minutes or so. Yeah, and then after that, so if you're, you're patient, you can put your uh, questions in the chat and we'll deal with them after that. So Edwin, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you again for doing this. This is a very important uh, issue and very important topic and it's fantastic to have expertise and professionalism like your firm to help us. No, oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for for these opportunities. Uh, it's great to be asked. Um, and thanks for uh, doing this together with us, Travis. Thanks for all the help. Um, hey, everybody, welcome. Um, we have a lot of work today, so I'm going to keep the introductions to uh, a minimum. I'll be supported by my team uh, as we go through what is probably uh, pretty much the top ten of tax audit issues. Yeah, what is what does the GDT uh, uh, what kind of position do they take in certain situations and what has been the uh, how have we fought how have we defended those issues what kind of evidence have we shown what kind of arguments have we used and what was the outcome uh, in, in, in uh, it, I think it's very important to be to be honest uh, to the market about what kind of uh, success rate we can have with different kind of arguments uh, with the GDT so it's going to be very practical it's just a series of examples, no names obviously, but a series of case studies and examples uh, that we uh, that we go through. And as uh, the chairman said, if you have questions, you know, put them in the chat and then we'll, we'll get to them later. Okay, um, uh, let's just go uh, very quickly to introduce, uh, um, for those of you who don't know it, VDB Loy, it's the, the law firm and, and tax advisory firm that I uh, that I've co-founded with uh, uh, Gene Loy, who I think many of you also know. Uh, we, we started out with around 20 people in 2012. Now we are 185. Our biggest office is in Myanmar, where we uh, where we still are, yes, uh, and uh, with about 100 staff. Here in Cambodia, the legal team and the tax team together is, is about uh, 65, 70 people. We're also in uh, Laos, in Vietnam, and uh, we have an affiliation in Indonesia. Uh, here in Cambodia, um, 
just some key people for you to know. Maritza Ng and Edith uh, Chingfei Ruan are the co-leaders of the legal team. Um, Maritza is a qualified uh, uh, Cambodian uh, attorney, and uh, you will get to know um, and uh, you will you will get to know some of uh, uh, of our tax leaders. Actually, all of our tax leaders here uh, uh, today. What, what do we do in, uh, in Cambodia besides tax work? On the next slide, some of the recent things that we've done just for introduction. We do a lot of power work here. So we've done every single solar project in Cambodia uh, so far. That's grid connected. Uh, we're very proud of that. We, we, just commercial, we, we just launched, helped launch a new commercial bank. Uh, that you may have heard uh, may have heard about Oriental Bank, yeah, that uh, is is uh, certain to make waves in uh, in the market. We merged two other banks uh, uh, recently. You've probably heard about that as well. I think in the near future you will hear a lot about the World Bank project to uh, um, rehabilitate uh, National Road Four, Five, and Six. Uh, we're we've been chosen by the World Bank as their council uh, to do that, so it gives you a little bit of an overview. Okay. Um, on the next slide, uh, I, I'm just going to briefly introduce my, my colleagues. The first one I'm going to introduce, and he's going to start immediately with uh, the first issues, is my, uh, my uh, tax partner, Sim Lai Sim. Uh, me and Lai Sim go way back. We, we started working together, I think it was 2007, um, uh, when, uh, before Vicky before Beloy existed. Um, he is uh, an, an exceptional uh, professional, uh, very well connected. Um, uh, very result oriented um, and uh, like Sim is going to talk about two hot tax issues. The first one he's going to start with is that about related party loans. Yeah. So advances that you have, any loans you have on the book as a audited company, they see a loan going out, they see a loan coming in. Okay, what, what is the tax, what are the tax authorities likely to say about that and how do you defend yourself uh, to that. So um, for logistical reasons, Lysim is uh, also here at our office, but he's in his, in, 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 his, uh, in his office so that the sound doesn't interfere with each other and things like that. And keeping to the government regulations. And like this, we're all, we're all vaccinated. We have, we have uh, you know, I can, I can post my card I can, in the chat if you like. But there's only four people in the room. Right? There you go. Yeah. So we're all in compliance. Um, like Sim, so what is the problem with related party loans? A lot of people have issues with that. Yeah. If you go to the next slide. Well, what's exactly the issue? Thank you, Edwin, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, happy to to see many of uh, people here. So uh, yes, some of them maybe know me before, some maybe new. So yes, yeah. I mean, related party loan. This is something that we have heard not just today, but been more than ten years. You know, uh, uh, reminding me back when I start, uh, you know, work as a Start, you know, been happen not just, you know, stop talking about it for at least five years from 2013 to 2018, you know, because during those uh, those uh, five years, there's a regulation quite clear that, you know, uh, a lot of people can have, you know, a uh, loan with a little party, you know, without interest or, you know, minimum interest. So the problem with the related party loan is about, you know, uh, 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 we are talking uh, loan without interest, between zero interest. Um, you know, when you start you're doing business sometime, you know, when you first start, you need some sort of a support from your related party with some sort of a fund where you you normally get as a loan from your parent company or maybe your sister company or other related parties. And those, they are not going to charge you any interest. So they offer you with a zero interest. As a borrower, you are very happy with that because you don't need to pay, you know, interest to your to the you know uh, to the lender so it's it's quite good for your business because you can have a uh, flexibility in terms of uh, you know cash flow and everything however the tax department is not share the happiness you know as you, you with you so they are not happy when they see that you get uh, you know without interest because what they why 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 do they they're not happy 
Yes, because uh, there's some sort of, uh, you know, uh, tax on that, you know, because if you are charging interest, they make collect some sort of uh, uh, tax, such as withholding tax. For example, for a non-resident uh, interest, going to be 14% withholding tax. Uh, if a resident loan, which is to uh, not to, uh, you know, a, you know, a financial uh, institution, that's going to be 15% on the interest payout. So that is the issue because the tax they want to see, you know, they want to collect some withholding tax on the things that that's, they, are, they can get it. So, so that is the, the, the issue. So the issue, uh, like we show here, you know, uh, in our uh, slide here related to uh, the next slide. Yes, Lai Sim, can we um, um, discuss what, what are the what are the defense measures that that we use for that? So, if if the tax department, if the GDT attacks you on the interest rate or on the loan, what is the evidence that we usually try to defend? Uh, hello, everyone, still here? Yeah, I'm, I'm asking on uh, slide nine now. Yeah, so what is the uh, defense that we can mount against the GDT in case that uh, there is uh, the, the, there are challenges in relation to that loan? Yes, I mean the so here's uh, slide nine. So the, the 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 challenges that we have is the tax department try to deem you know uh, the the okay try to deem the interest on the interest free loan or, in, or, or the loan which is, uh, you know, have a low or uh, low interest uh, uh, charges. So, yeah, of course, the defense that we can use based on the regulation we have right now is based on the instruction 4909, which uh, we list out all the, you know, the, 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 the legal grounds and, uh, you know, the, the supporting document that we need to uh, you know, to to argue again the deemed interest. For example, uh, first is that what you have to get is that is the loan agreement. You have to have a, a loan agreement, a proper ones. You know, signed by both parties. Uh, it clearly states that the loan is you know withdraw or uh, interest low or anything like that. So and also you need to have some sort of business plan uh, describing the need of the loans. So that is very important to justify that, you know, why you need this loan with zero interest or low interest. And other document to explain the basis to determine the interest rate. This is something also important uh, to, to justify the source of the fund, which is probably the, the, the lender uh, part of it. If uh, in case that the, the lender get the loan from other source, which is not their own money, then you need to, to justify to them that the loan they can get is also with very low or zero interest. And that's why they, they lend to you uh, with, you know, the same uh, or zero, uh, uh, the same rate or zero interest rate. And also, they also need to have a board of directors resolution to, you know, to approve that the company can get the loan with that amount and also with the uh, such rate, zero rate. Uh, but uh, if you are, a, you know, a single member private limited companies, maybe you don't need to have that one. So because they're sole shareholder, most of the time you will have a sole uh, uh, directors. So you don't need to have a, you know, a, a comprehensive board of director resolution. So and also to show that to show the bank statement that you actually get a loan from uh, related parties where, uh, you know, that's just justify the amount you put in your financial statement. So, yeah, that's we have all of this, you know, uh, our, based on our experience, we have very, very high success rate. So, but anyway, you know, all of this is case by case. But what we show up here, so we, we show that we what we have done uh, in the past and we, we have success. So, um, thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, ask a question. In practically dealing with audits, I think what uh, a lot of taxpayers go through, especially comprehensive audits. Uh, if you look at the uh, sequence in the history of transfer pricing and uh, then the notification uh, that was put out uh, in terms of uh, having uh, 
and market ratings were slow. So in 2017, we get the, uh, the I guess, the practice about transfer pricing. Uh, so in that in that uh, issuance of that, there was no discussion of uh, interest-free loans or loans in general. It just said the applied transfer pricing. In 2018, then the GDT puts out the notification to say, let me clarify that this is uh, uh, transfer pricing is applicable to to shareholder loans. Now, <clears throat> I think in audits, this is used uh, quite often by auditors to say, well, transfer pricing went into 17, but yet there's a 2018 notification that says you have to apply it to shareholder loans. So to me, it sort of says, well, if it was applicable to shareholder loans, it should have been clear in 2017 and not 2018. So when you have comprehensive audits, it, the auditors do attempt to go back to 2017 and apply uh, an assessment if the uh, loan is uh, interest-free. I think the other thing is also whether interest-free loans are acceptable or not. Uh, the notification is clear it has to be at a market rate. I think it's very clear also that if it's a single member, as you mentioned, uh, that there's very little credit risk in lending it to your own company that you own, whether it's debt or equity, and that that loan should be, if a bank was assessing it, should be at a, a lower rate than the uh, the NBC rates, which are really high at 8% uh, plus. So that's another issue. And the other issue being, if you have somebody lending from Singapore in the US where rates are two or 3%, um, is there a case to convince auditors that if you went to a loan for a bank, let's say in the US, well, that you would have a two or 3% interest rate rather than the NBC rate being 8%. Mm. So it's, it's how you deal with uh, yeah. your credit risk from the lender's country. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I, I worked at the GDT while they are still were preparing these transfer pricing, uh, you know, so it, it had actually a very long uh, uh, history of support by the IMF, um, um, mostly, and also from uh, uh, from uh, uh, U uh, U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U U Number one is the reality of the loan itself. Is Does the loan really exist? Uh, is there really a loan? It is for the taxpayer to prove a deduction. So if you claim an interest on a loan, or if you have an entry in your accounting that says that, well, we have this money, where does it come from? Oh, this is from our shareholder. And why is it not capital? It is not capital because it is a loan. Um, it is for the taxpayer to actually prove with uh, documentation that, and, and maybe with money inflows with bank statements, that this loan really exists. Yeah. Then you have a second point. If that loan really exists, then what is the arm's length interest rate that we can, uh, that that we should uh, be paying or that we should be uh, paying withholding tax uh, about? That that becomes a whole other complicated uh, uh, scenario because. Even if you consider that, you know, this is my subsidiary, I have no additional risk in borrowing to, to my subsidiary. That is not how you're supposed to look at it from a tax perspective, because from a tax perspective, we are supposed to, to treat both of them as separate in unrelated enterprises. So even though this is my subsidiary saying that I'm charging a lower rate because it's my subsidiary, that is actually not an acceptable reasoning in, trans in, in transfer pricing uh, principles. You are supposed to treat your subsidiary as if it is a third party. That is the whole basis of, of uh, uh, transfer pricing. Um, uh, so uh, it, 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 it is, I think you know, we try to explain here, when we defend a case like this, you know, we, we, we try to foremost try to attack the suspicion of the GDT that this loan is all doesn't really exist, you know. And you would be surprised how many taxpayers, uh, because this is a, a very fruitful attack for the GDT. If they can, if you do not have evidence that this loan exists, then we can actually treat it as part of, of your revenue or of a, a growth in net, net assets of the company. And every everything, if it turns out that you don't have to pay back a million dollar loan, of course you will be taxed on that profit because that is a profit for you, right? So that is a very fruitful attack to say that, well, I see this money coming in. Uh, you'd be surprised how many taxpayers do not have a proper loan agreement in place. 
do not have any board minutes about a loan that is so important to their company. Never was a board meeting held. There are no minutes. Uh, you know, everything has to be. Uh, it's all, sp you know, spun of the spur of the moment kind of thing. And that is often when ha what happens when we, as as tax advisors, we have to help the Cambodian subsidiary, which is usually within a group of international taxpayers, the one that nobody talks about or thinks about until it's too late. Let me have a comment on that. Obviously, shareholder loans is a very hot topic, and it's, it's probably the number one target for auditors uh, to on assessments. Mm. There's no doubt about that. A lot of these shareholder loans are historical, so you have uh, taxpayers that originally had these loans at zero interest, and had you know hadn't adjusted for the transfer pricing notification. Yeah. I would say in the SME sector, and I think this is important. I believe mm -hmm. in certainly what you're saying on uh, it's a possibility uh, that the loans don't exist. My experience is are the loans do exist, but but they're not properly documented. Right. But the, yeah, the yeah. issue for me, and I think the issue I think the GDT and Cambodia in general needs to uh, explore. If there's a shareholder loan by an SME, meaning a very small business, they they don't want to put equity in. Mm -hmm. And we know small business drives economies. Mm -hmm. Like in the U.S., it's 90 percent of the economy. It's very important. So we need to be a little bit more appreciative that small business owners uh, will put in shareholder loans because businesses are, are short of cash, short of capital, mm -hmm. and they don't want to put equity in and then, uh, again, sort of not have the option of taking it out when the business becomes profitable. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about small businesses that truly want to capitalize their business don't want to put so much equity in, but want to be able to, and usually it's individual, that you said single members, that just want to put money in to have the business survive over the initial period. Mm -hmm. Now, to me, that's a low credit risk. I mean, that those, those burdening a business with an eight or 9% interest rate, when you're just trying to capitalize the business so it could actually run and operate in early stages, seems not sensible. So, I mean, I think there should be an exploration, at least, uh, but we're looking to try to support the economy, yeah. That for having SMEs have some sort of a better uh, situation in those cases where you have businesses that are under $25,000 or something in capital that yeah. decide to, to put in a, a loan at a, at a rate. And I think the other, if I may add, add if you could, what is it if somebody's in Singapore at a 1% interest rate or 2% interest rate loan? That's, that's their cost of funds, let's say, to lend into a, a Cambodian yeah. Why does it have to be eight or nine percent? It, it, it doesn't have to be, and uh, we have a tax treaty with uh, uh, Singapore um, that actually provides that we, uh, that both the tax authorities, so the IRAS and the GDT, they should actually agree on what is an interest rate that is normal at arm's length between the two, so that you don't have discrepancies because discrepancies lead to double taxation though. So we have actually a mutual agreement procedure for that. We've done some of these before, mutual agreement procedure. It is an incredible headache, yeah, but it is very important that it exists as a tool. Um, in the interest of time, shall we? Please, yeah. Um, it's, a hot, see, it's a really hot topic. And I see many questions coming in. I'm sure we're going we're gonna to talk about it more. Lysim, can you tell us about the next issue that is about pass-through payments? So this is, um, uh, let, let me explain what the situation is, and then maybe you, you, you tell us how you would handle the defense against the GDT for that. Yeah, so in these pass-through situations on, on that is slide uh, 10, I believe, yeah. Um, so we have a, a, a company that, that will actually um, uh, um, receive amounts from its principal, usually overseas maybe another company or an organization, and those um, those amounts go through on slide 10, yeah? Uh, and those uh, those amounts go through the bank account of the Cambodian company, but they are not revenue of the Cambodian company. This is just money that the Cambodian company needs to reimburse, needs to hand out, needs to pass through, yeah? Uh, we had a case, for example, of a uh, a consulting a ser a services company that provides services to development organizations and part of its service was receiving subsidies from overseas and paying out those grants and subsidies to different Cambodian or, uh, uh, projects. Yeah? So this is not their money, yeah? but the money goes through your accounts. You may also see this in the logistics industry where uh, agents will collect 
hundred dollar from the customer, but actually eighty dollar of that hundred dollar is not for them. That is actually what they have to pay to the freight forwarder and and uh, or to the the shipping company. So in in in, in such a case, like Sam, the the problem is often that when the GDT sees an amount of money going through the the accounts of the company, going through the bank account of the company, or sometimes even being booked as revenue by the company, then they will they will they will want to tax it, right? Yes, correct, Edwin. Yeah, because you know uh, this this type of uh, you know uh, judgment is, is not just happening yeah. now, uh, uh, but it's happened also. Uh, long long times ago so uh, they only interested in the money uh, going to bank accounts and especially based on the uh, uh, restricted on the you know for the tax audit that they also require you to provide a bank account so in auditor they normally interested in you know the money coming in if they see the coming money coming in the first uh, and the majority of what they are thinking is that uh, the income so uh, when they see that they want to tax you we see one percent prepayments and toi so you know, so in that case, if you are a, you know, a partial or an agent, you know, you are just an agent or maybe consulting company, it just, uh, you know, the, the money just passed through you, the money in is not your income, but actually you disperse back, uh, uh, disperse out to the other parties based on the, uh, you know, the agreement you have with your principal or with, you know, the, 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 the other party, then of course, you need to have, you know, uh, an agreement, a management service agreement or a commission or any kinds of agreement to justify your relationship between you and the principal and you also the, the another party or other parties in Cambodia. So that's that's the main, main document. If you don't have uh, an agreement in place, I, I can tell you, you know, the chance for you to actually success is not, maybe not, maybe zero. So that is very important, management or commission service agreement. And also other supporting document. So uh, supporting document is that to show you how much money you are in and what kind of a document you request for a, a, a fund from the principal or maybe a document that you know the 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 party based on the the example here. Let's say you know the NGO one or NGO two, uh, you know, request from you for money and you actually disperse on the same amount that they request, or if any change in terms of a payment, you, you have to document it every single transaction you have and you record it. So uh, that, that's what you need to do. Yeah, so if you have all of those documents, you know, we, based on our experience, you know, we, we can, you know, uh, 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 have a very high chance to actually success. But if you don't have those documents, you know, to justify the transaction and, and you know, that's the chance to success is very low or it turned into zero. So that's that's uh, you know we, we set out here we, we put here in the slide what type of document you need to, to, to provide. Yeah. So this is something yeah. that we yeah. Yeah, th thank you, Lyson. That, that's very helpful. Um, let, let's go. Uh, I see a lot of questions on this one as well, but let's go to the uh, next situation. And uh, thanks, Lyson. We may need you later on. Uh, we're going to the head of our tax disputes team, uh, uh, Mr. Sudet. And uh, Mr. Sudet is going to talk first about uh, a very common issue uh, that's actually fairly recent. We didn't used to do this when I was still advising the GDT, uh, we didn't have that approach. Uh, when uh, nowadays, when you find a director, that uh, is, uh, most directors in Cambodia are not being paid by the company. Yeah, a lot of directors in Cambodia are actually not residents of Cambodia. It is not required in Cambodia to be a resident of the country to be a director. So, in many many cases, you have managers or or something like that who are employees. Of, of the company, but the director is not one of those. The director may be a representative of the shareholder, maybe somebody who was at a, who is at a higher level or who may or may not be overseas. Um, it, it is only since several years, yeah, that uh, I, I'm too old now, but so that it's only yeah, back, I know in, in, in 2006, 2007, we didn't use, used to do this at the GDT. Um, but now when the GDT sees, sees a director that and there is no PIT being deducted in connection with any salary for that director, because they argue that no, our, our director worked for free. That is uh, something that, that the GDT will have its own thoughts about. What, what do they think about that? So that. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Edwin, for for this one. Yeah, I, I believe that many of the company who have been audited by the GDT may most uh, mostly that face this kind of issue that the tax authority they try to impose the tax on the director who have listed in the AOI of the company because from their perspective, as you have mentioned, that they never work for free. So at least they got something from the company, even though that uh, actually that those director did not receive any remuneration from uh, the company. So yeah, from, from this point that uh, what we can do right now that uh, we have the law in place that we can prove our sale that like you can see that the at call 5-1 that talking about the salary and that you are the employee and if you receive the salary payment, of course that you will uh, need to pay the salary tax, but if you don't yet, if you did not receive, of course that you have no salary tax to be paid. Yeah, at, at this point that uh, it's very common that uh, from my experience, experience that I met very often when I deal with the tax authority that uh, they try to impose the tax even though they did know that they did not receive any salary from uh, the company. So from my from my view on this one, I try to explain to them about the nature, about the status of the those director that they are really uh, located in, in, in Cambodia and Yep, uh, and also that uh, if they receive in, in general term that if they receive the the remuneration and that the remuneration should be subject to the uh, withholding tax rather than the salary that according to the residency of the director. But of course, that's mostly those director is not located in the Cambodia, so it should not be uh, no way that they, they be deemed as the uh, the. Uh, the the employee of the company. So what we can do in order to prove this one that uh, yeah, we can show them about our AOI of the company because I understand that in the AOI of the company they have have an article that's mentioned about the remuneration of the director that uh, should be received that will be determined by the company. You have to prove them about your bank statement in order to prove about there is no payment to be paid to those director, your payroll list, uh, that list down all the all the employee that uh, register with I mean that is is the who are currently working with the with the company and also the passport in order to prove about your the, the presentation I mean uh, the the presence of the director in Cambodia which is not uh, sometimes they come uh, to visit one one or two time a month or something that we can prove them that they are not really based in Cambodia. And yeah, and the last point is about the personal best statement of the director. If we can justify them, of course that uh, yeah, we have very high chance that we can overturn the reassessment or we can uh, uh, inform back to auditor that you yeah, have the way that they uh, reassess is not really correct, that we have this kind of document that we can prove. So this is all the what we can defend ourselves. I have a comment on this as well. So again, in the SME sector, Shareholders usually are putting in small amounts of capital, whether it's ten to thirty, forty thousand dollars. And of course, those shareholders that are putting in the capital of the company don't want to take a salary and take it back. It just doesn't make a sense. Yeah. When a business is first starting, why would you put money in and then pay yourself a salary and take it out when you need that money for the business? So I think that's that argument uh, needs to be clear, and I think the GDT generally accepts that. Yeah. In terms of directors, I think there is some caution in registering a company as well. I think the MOC tends to just make all shareholders directors when they necessarily don't have to be unless you specifically tell them not to. I, that is at least my experience. Some, I think some MOC agents may do that. Uh, you have to be a bit careful with that. We don't use agents. We do. Uh, we draft all of it ourselves because I, I've seen that before to save time and and save on communication. Yeah. They, they just you know go ahead with the thing. You have five shareholders. You have five automatic directors. Boom. So I yeah. think you have to be very clear when you're registering your company that not all shareholders have to be directors. Yeah. So you yeah. could avoid that bullet in case uh, as well. I guess the question I would have is that uh, there are companies overseas that possibly aren't here. They're starting their operations. They want a Cambodian director, but not really to work for the company, just to be part of the company in terms of signing, uh, maybe signing contracts, but uh, not not a nine to five employees, a sporadic sort of responsibility where maybe they give them a nominal fee of $100. A, a governance role. Yeah, a governance, a governance role, role yeah. but they still give $100. Yeah. 
I think that sometimes in audits, the auditors have a problem with that saying, how could somebody pay paid only a hundred dollars and be a director? When that's what fact, I would ask. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, th what is your opinion on that? Well, I, th I think first of all, since so that, uh, we need to recognize that there are directors who work for free. Uh, I, I believe you know you, you work so hard for Amcham, but I understand you actually don't get a, don't get a salary from Amcham. You know this is a, it costs me more money and time. This is know. scandalous, <laughs> scandalous to begin with. But it's a good example of how people might work very hard for their organization. And uh, you know being being a director is is really more uh, a. Uh, uh, a, a matter of responsibilities rather than performing tasks. Yeah, uh, you have a liability. You have a corporate responsibility. You are a corporate officer more than anything else. Yeah, that is how directors were created. Um, so that uh, you can agree a compensation for that or not. I think it helps a lot, as so that also mentioned. I think it helps a lot if we specifically provide in the AOI that the director shall not be remunerated. Yeah. And you deviate there from the MOC template, and you actually make that explicit. That will help you in this in this kind of uh, uh, situations. And I see so that you have you have a high rate of, of success with that. Yes, uh, it's an honor to be <laughs> the president of the chair. Yes, it, I was speaking it, we're for a myself. Profit organization, yeah. and I'm honored to be elected and being able to serve. So. You, you told me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, kidding, kidding. Yeah. Uh, okay. So that. Thank you very much. And I note that we have a very high success rate on that with the GDT. So this is one of the hot issues that is that is perfectly avoidable. Yeah. Let's uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, in, you know, conscious of time, and that is a, a very very famous one. Uh, the deemed profit margins or the deemed revenue uh, that uh, that gets. Uh, reconstituted by the GDT. Um, uh, I, I will explain what the situation is so that uh, you tell me what you and your team do when you are confronted with that. <coughs> Excuse me. So, in our example, you see on slide, uh, what is that, 16, you see a Cambodia uh, and Cambodian construction business that has a fluctuating profit margin. Yeah, I bet they, they do. And over the last uh, five years, as per its uh, financial statements, the cost in 2019, uh, which is the year that's being audited, were actually quite high relatively, but the income was not significantly different. So the profit margin has actually reduced quite a bit. The cost stayed up there, but the revenue has not proportionally increased. So the GDT looks at the situation and says, you know, there's something wrong with this. We think you have misstated your cost or you have misstated your revenue. Maybe you forgot to declare something, it happens, or maybe you have included some costs that actually don't belong here. Maybe they belong in one of your other companies, I don't know. But I don't really believe that your profit margin is lower. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to look at some other taxpayers that the GDT has audited in the past. And we see certain profit margins there, and I'm actually going to take that as the benchmark. And I'm going to actually add, uh, I'm going to assume that you should have a 20 or 30 percent profit margin on top of your costs. And that is how I get to a new revenue and also a new taxable profit. Yeah. And uh, this is a double whammy because it's going to cost you uh, tax on income, uh, of course, on, on 20 percent or maybe 1 percent if you are below uh, the cost still. Uh, and it's also going to cost you VAT if this is an additional revenue. So this can be very costly. So this this happens uh, quite often. Huh? So that can you tell me some sectors where this is uh, where you have seen this, this kind of problem? Yeah, uh, thank you, Edwin. Yeah. yeah, this one is the also one of the uh, the most uh, issue that really uh, happen in right now that the mostly that I face is the company when firstly that they will look it look at the financial statement and of course that they will compare the pro gross profit margin every year if the year that become a little bit lower and of course that they will come in question in mind that why this year that the company make a, a, a really low profit margin that they will deeply into uh, examine the cost also the revenue whether and make a comparison as you just mentioned about this one so because the reason that they uh, come up with this kind of the 
assumption because it's based on the law on Article 119. It, it's about the burden of proof. And it, it, as you can see in, in the slide that, uh, that really, uh, clearly about the uh, obligation, I mean, that the power that the GDT can impose on on the company that uh, if they can find that, uh, yeah, the company have a very high expense, or uh, you have buy more asset, of course that why you need to generate less income. So it come in mind to them about the doubt that we need to prove them by why is why the profit margin of the year that every is not high is not the same as another year. So the so what we can do right now that we, we would like to prove our style that yeah uh, we need to prove this one with that that you need to do it to provide a logical reason why the cost is low, why the cost is increased based on your actual transaction based on your business, the nature of your business, you need to try to explain them about the, your business, that why it impact to the cost, why it is uh, cost the low profits margin. And also if possible, please prepare the uh, the comparison. If you work on the project basis, you to do a comparison about the uh, gross profit margin of a project that you can show them clearly, hey, here is my, my project, that is my project, here is my cross profit margin or a project that I earn. So if you compare as a whole, of course, there will be impact to the gross profit margin of the company. But if you compare individual project, of course, that you can see clearly that, yeah, my cross, my cross profit margin are, is not really different. So in order to prove this one, that you to add on on our position, you have to prove them about the, our audit report, about the, the contract that it's clearly stated about the term of payment, about the amount of the contract that you need to earn, and also the bank statement to justify your transaction that all expense is really happened, and also the uh, invoice, purchasing invoice from your uh, supplier that uh, those expense is really happened. We did not do anything wrong. So all reporting is based on the actual amount that we paid. So there's no room for them that just simply look at uh, the comparison of the cross profit margin and import the tag on us. So yeah, based on my experience that dealing with this one, that the, the chance that we can uh, win on, on this case is very uh, good, that we can, uh, yeah, if you have sufficient document to prove our position. Uh, thank you so that. That's, that's very helpful. Uh, Anthony, you have some experience. I have a comment on this one. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, when everything is perfectly done, and uh, a, a taxpayer is absolutely compliant, this becomes a bit of grasping for straws, as we say, mm -hmm. for auditors. I mean, they, if nothing can be found, then this is sort of a, how do I get something? And I think we have to be careful with this. For me, and this is a personal opinion, uh, not all businesses in the same industry perform the same. So you can't really expect, especially if somebody who's starting out, you can't expect a Walmart or a Sears or a Kmart or all these guys to have the same profit margins. There's different companies that have different market shares that will perform better than others. So that's one point. The other point is, I think this becomes a little bit uh, silly in a way with the auditors. It's my opinion again. Uh, there are people trying to manage their business. They manage a certain profit margin and then get uh, sort of uh, accused of not being, uh, being able to manage their business as good as somebody else. Uh, it's easy for somebody in the um, public sector to say something to somebody in the private sector, but again, try to manage their business any better. And, and I think yeah. that, that this, this becomes a little bit of a, a last sort of straw, you know, sort of thing to try to assess. I, I, I'm going to take the other viewpoint. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> what, what you need to appreciate, what people don't, don't appreciate, is where the GDT officials are coming from. Because they deal 90% of the time, 95% of the time, they do not deal with taxpayers who are completely transparent, completely honest, who declare everything, who are uh, uh, not engaging in, in, any, uh, in, in, in any weird things. Yeah? Most of the time, tax officials are confronted with taxpayers who don't want to give, who don't want to be transparent, who did not record things. And you can see from their from their statements that, from their financial statements, that uh, things are not above board. And um, I, I think, you know, we, we do need to understand a little bit these officials. It's frustrating for them too. 
And when you are confronted all the time, uh, most of the time, with people who are like that, you start to treat the other 5% who is trying to be transparent, you know, um, also in a way as if they are not transparent. So I do understand a bit where they're, where they're coming from. Um, but it is, it, it is true that it is a, a very blunt instrument. Yeah, um, uh, section uh, section 119 of uh, really was made for uh, a taxpayer who declares ten thousand dollar income but drives with a Bentley. Yeah, <laughs> that, that that is that is what it's made for. Let me yeah. let me agree with you. That absolutely, I don't know if it's ninety five percent. I hope it's less. <laughs> but there are still a large pool of taxpayers out there yeah. that are not reporting honestly. I would only say that there should be some recognition for those that do. But those that you have an accounting system yeah. and have a third party doing their accounting and doing their tax, that they really strive to actually do honest and that they yeah. are given credit for that. And and for those, it is very frustrating to be confronted with this position because how do you prove a negative? Yeah, I mean, when when you come home at night, late at night, and your wife asks you. Prove to me that you were not unfaithful to me in the last five hours. How do you prove that? Yeah, and that is what so that is talking about. Yeah, we need to prove that we don't have more income. How do you prove that? Yeah, it is a negative. It, well, this is my income. That's all I can show you. I cannot prove to you I, I don't have more. Yeah, I can show you my bank statements. Uh, I can uh, I can show you my contracts. I cannot prove you. To prove to, to you that something did not happen. So yeah? it's not the U.S. Uh, sort of theory of innocent until proven guilty. It's <laughs> guilty until proven innocent. Yeah. But anyway, the GDP yeah. does do a great job. I just, I just think it's a, a matter of balance. Yeah. That if yeah. you get presented with third-party accounting reports, third-party tax, you need like, the benefit of the doubt. You need yeah. to give them the benefit You're of the doubt. You're going through that expense and effort. Then. Yeah. yeah. So, so that how how is our how is VDB Loy's success rate in defending? This kind of issue. If if you have this kind of documentation, uh, how good is our success rate? I, I think you are muted. Uh, so that we have to unmute you. Just a second. Yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, from my, my real experience that uh, that uh, I deal dealing with uh, this kind of issue that yeah, uh, the win rate that for 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 me is very good that we can overturn the reassessment. Okay, good. Let, let's move on to the next one, and we stay with so that this is a, this is also a very common issue that's been around in Cambodia for a very long time. The difference between custom values and the invoice uh, value, right? So let, let's go to a, to an example. Um, we have a company uh, that that is a QIP company. It could be uh, you know maybe a, a power plant or a, or a factory, and that is importing raw materials and machinery. Um, the company has a QIP status, uh, and the import VAT was borne by the state. So this happens sometimes with power plants or with other projects that are in the national interest. So that that this means that the value, uh, you know, when you import the equipment, actually you you're not paying any taxes. Then you're not paying customs duty. You're not paying uh, VAT. Uh? Um, and then, uh, we, but the customs value that is that is actually declared in the customs entry form is, uh, for example, eighty dollar, while the commercial invoice is a hundred dollar. So we, we we actually see a difference of twenty dollar. In in other words, uh, in the financial statements of the company, we see this equipment is uh, is uh, booked at a hundred dollar purchased for a hundred dollar but the customs entry value says that it was only eighty dollar uh, at the moment of, of import now um, the, the issue is that the GDT might in some instances take this uh, uh, take the difference between the two as an undeclared revenue they might say well you know actually you declare this this plant at a uh, hundred dollar, but I, I know from other uh, information that it's only eighty dollars. So that means that your your costs were actually inflated by twenty, uh, or otherwise, uh, uh, in other words, you know, this is actually a revenue that you didn't declare. And I'm going to levy VAT on that. I'm going to levy tax on on uh, income uh, income tax uh, on that. Um, so this is a common issue, right? So that in in what industries does this happen a lot? Yeah, uh, 
Yeah, again, okay. thank you, Edwin, for, for the briefly about the background on this one. Yeah, this one is mostly happened with the manufacturer that they the one who mostly import the raw material or machinery from the from out overseas that in order to for, for their production that mostly that uh, when they are the QIP that when they import they uh, complete the custom value based on the master list that mostly that we follow the, the master list and that's one that that is root cost that become the the variant between the commercial invoice and the custom value so yes uh, from the GDT uh, from my experience that the tooling about the the dispute the is the the first thing that when the auditor they come up to the audit the factory they will go through your uh, purchase of the raw material during the year and make a comparison with your declaration on the monthly tax return that you declare based on the custom value while you record in your uh, account is on the real the real uh, the real invoice is the based on the commercial invoice and which is amount is uh, higher then the customer you and then they come up with a question hey you why why that you declare only this why your account is record too much so this means that the the difference it should be that you it's mean that you you sell it locally that it should subject to tax so of course that i will import the tax on you even though that yeah they know that sometimes that this is the the variant about the custom value the best on the master list even though they can prove that they still have something that, that they want to talk so uh, for this kind of issue that I, I experienced to dealing with them, that I try to justify the transaction, explain to them the reality, why it's different, why the custom value is lower than the commercial. And of course, that we can prove them by show them the audit report, that we can truly say that, hey, here is my audit report that verified by the independent auditor that justified my transaction. And all that all happened uh, is real. And also the contract, if you have the service contract with your supplier or you have the purchase order, that also part of your supporting document that you have to prove that here is my real cost. Here is my uh, here is the amount that the supplier charged me. And also that the bank statement, if you have any, uh, I mean the bank statement to prove that I we really saw this amount based on the commercial invoice, not the custom invoice. And also, of course, that the the commercial invoice from the supplier that uh, so the, uh, the exactly the amount that we really caught in our uh, accounting book. So yeah, for the rate of the success that uh, that we can overturn is very high. That because it is, I, I can say it is the just black and white that we can show them about clearly what is different, what is the the proof that we can justify that. Of course, that uh, they they will accept this one. And yep, and my experience that uh, we win very high chance that we can win on this one. OK, thank you, Sudet. Um, in the interest of time, let's go to case study number six uh, and uh, to my colleague, uh, uh, Sivila Kim, um, Mr. Villa. Uh, he's a tax partner uh, with us, and he's actually our, our newest tax partner. He's, he's been, uh, he joined the partnership of uh, VDB Lloyd just, uh, just, uh, uh, just over a month ago. So congratulations again, Villa. Um, Villa, you are um, the first issue that you're going to talk about is uh, transfer pricing attacks. And um, I, I had a very simple example that we have seen in practice. A company is paying service fee to uh, service fees to its related parties, uh, management fees, marketing fees, uh, also interest. Yeah, and the company has paid withholding tax on that on those fees, 10% under DTA. I think in that particular case it was. Uh, it was with Thailand. Um, what what would the GDT when they see these service fees paid to head office and pay to a uh, related party? What does the GDT usually do? Okay, um, thank you, Edwin. Uh, I think um, a few years ago, um, uh, most company might not experience uh, this kind of uh, uh, transfer pricing because it's just been uh, introduced in Cambodia. So. When uh, we have the related party transaction in the past, except for the loan, I mean, uh, the only thing that tech auditor will check is that if you have paid the 14% withholding tech on your like uh, management service or marketing uh, fee to your head office. But now, uh, seeing the introduction of the transfer pricing, or we can say uh, in short, a TP rule in Cambodia, uh, the tech department uh, it's starting to looking more deeper into uh, this kind of issue by uh, uh, trying to identify whether do you really need this kind of management service from your head office, whether the amount charged is uh, 
it at arm's length, whether it's too much, it's too low, whether uh, is it uh, really uh, give benefit to your uh, operation, your um, profit generation, something like that. So the, uh, the, the issue that we have seen is that uh, uh, the GDT have come up with some kind of benchmark to say that uh, the uh, management fee that we have paid is uh, a bit more uh, higher so that uh, they say uh, it is not really um, beneficial to the company, something like that based on the benchmark they have uh, received. The markup rate is high, so they they, they seek to uh, disallow certain portion of the uh, uh, management service expense that we have uh, incurred to our head office. So um, the, the 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 how we can deal with that uh, uh, problem is that we need to have the supporting document. Of course, supporting document are always the uh, most important thing that we need to have during the tax audit. So in this case, we need to have the agreement that uh, clearly outline. Okay, what are the scope of work that the head office will be uh, provided to your to the subsidiary in Cambodia, and how we can use this kind of uh, management service to uh, benefit our operation to to the uh, 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 profit generation of the company. And also, we, we will also need to show that, uh, okay, with the audit report and the bank statement to show them that, okay, this is the real uh, amount that we actually paid to the, the head office. It's not just the uh, amount that we just uh, making up. And last but not least, the most important uh, item that we should have is the uh, transfer pricing report. Uh, with the uh, introduction of the uh, transfer pricing rule, the uh, tax department required that uh, entity with the related party transaction need to have the uh, transfer pricing report prepared. But in that uh, rule, the, uh, the GDT do not require us to submit, but you just need to make it available upon request of the uh, tax auditor of the tax department. Um, by seeing that, okay, there's no requirement for submission, there's no require, there's no penalty, even though you uh, do not prepare or submit something like that. Uh, uh, most companies tend to ignore, uh, to forget, you know, to prepare this kind of uh, report uh, in order to justify it a related party transaction. Uh, so from our experience, by having this uh, TP report is a great help when you're dealing with the tax uh, auditor regarding your related party transaction. So um, if you have uh, all these kinds of supporting documents, especially the transfer pricing uh, report, so we can uh, easily uh, uh, success with this kind of uh, uh, issue with the tech department. Yeah, thank you, Villa. And uh, VD Beloy has a lot of experience in pre uh, preparing these reports. Depending on your situation, certain taxpayers, uh, we can offer this report at 9,000 9, USD for three years. So that is 3,000 USD per year. Include everything, the report and the benchmarking. Uh, that, that rate applies to most of, uh, most of the clients that apply to us. Some maybe do not. If you're interested in that, you can uh, let us know. Let's go to um, the next issue, Villa. It's also one of your, uh, one of, one of your uh, uh, frequent, uh, uh, frequent uh, occurrences in practice, uh, selling shares. Uh, and we actually had uh, a case on that very recently where uh, a Cambodian, the shareholders of a Cambodian company in this example, they are individuals from overseas. They sell their shares in uh, in in a Cambodian company uh, to uh, company B, which is the buyer. Yeah, and uh, they realize a gain in the in the process. Um, okay, we've all heard that there is a capital gain tax coming very soon from the first of January of of next year. But actually, we have this problem right now. Yeah. Um, also for sales that happened last year or the year before. Can you explain to our audience why? Yes, uh, I will, uh, Edwin. Um, again, uh, similar to the uh, transfer pricing issue, I mean, uh, sale of share is uh, just become a, uh, a new topic, a new hot topic for uh, during the tax audit. Because um, before, I mean, tax auditor will just uh, see, okay, if you have paid the 0.1% on the value of your share when you've done the transfer, or you have uh, properly uh, notified to the tax department within the timeline required after you obtain the approval from the CDC and also the MOC. Uh, 
But uh, since then, uh, since the uh, uh, introduction or in, uh, of a certain update or change in the regulation related to the chain of share, it's, also, it's become an interest of the uh, uh, tech department to look at it when uh, the tech payer have the uh, uh, transaction related to uh, the sale of share. And uh, so the GDT has uh, introduced uh, a few uh, uh, tech items related to this uh, sale of share. The first one is 14% uh, withholding tax on the DIM uh, dividend distribution on the portion of your return earning that associated with the share sold. So, so it's not the, the whole return earning, only the portion that related to the, uh, the, the share that being sold. And the second item, which is um, uh, I think uh, most uh, uh, people are not uh, paying attention to that, is the addition of uh, definition in the uh, 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 community source of income uh, by adding that uh, gain of uh, uh, sale from share in the definition of the uh, uh, community source income as well. Which means when we have a gain, we also need to pay 14% withholding tax on those uh, gain. And last but not least uh, is the uh, uh, the capital gain tax, which is applied at the rate of uh, twenty percent uh, on the gain. And uh, with the notification from the tax department, the implementation is uh, delayed up to uh, January twenty twenty. Uh, so if you can see that uh, the uh, the uh, implication by the tax department, it seems like you have two type of tax on the uh, the same gain. But uh, from the verbal confirmation, of course, there's no uh, official uh, confirmation yet that uh, when the capital gain tax is in uh, uh, effect, so you do not need to pay the 14% on the gain, on the gain of share gain. So um, the issue around uh, this is that, as uh, Edwin has just uh, mentioned, uh, it is it's like uh, when there there is uh, this kind of tax that we can uh, Tech from the seller of the share, uh, tech department has tried to impose those kind of tech on the transaction, even though those transactions happen before the effective date of each uh, uh, tech item. So yeah, I, I guess. Uh, sorry to sorry to interrupt, but I guess indeed, if if they approach it from the perspective that it is a deemed dividend. Yeah, uh, that there is a deemed profit distribution, then you you would immediately, logically, the GDT would turn itself to the company that's being sold rather than to the foreign shareholders that maybe are very difficult to send an assessment to, right? Um, and yeah. if, if the GDT is very clear about the selling price, um, and in some cases this is in the media, yeah, big transactions, they're in the media because the buyer is a listed company and this is all disclosed, then uh, there's very little for us to say actually uh, because of the um, the amendments that were made to the laws uh, that you just set out uh, in defining this as Cambodia source income. And uh, we, we, we already had a very expensive wide definition of what is a dividend. Um, it's, it's kind of tough to, to, to fight against this kind of issue, right? Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, in the interest of time, let, let me take you to slide uh, 28, um, and maybe let's keep this one a bit briefer. Um, on, uh, what, what are the common issues that we see in tax audits, uh, tax audit related to fringe benefits? Oh, okay. Uh, so I will just uh, keep it short. I mean, uh, the uh, the. Uh, the issue that we have also uh, mostly experienced during the tax audit related to a uh, fringe benefit is when uh, your company has provided a certain kind of uh, item to your employee. In this case, is including a uh, meal uh, allowance, the telephone use of company car, gasoline, visa, and work permit. So um, again, supporting document is very uh, important to justify that whether those provision is for the business or for the uh, personal purpose so that you can justify to the tax auditor during the tax audit. Uh, this is uh, something related to the uh, fringe benefit. And an another uh, two more issues that we have also uh, commonly seen during the tax audit. Uh, this is uh, the second one is the deposit which is uh, normally we might not pay a lot of attention to that one because, um, for example, you receive the deposit and uh, in your record, 
the deposit is not recognized as your income. So that you will not uh, do any uh, tax calculation on that deposit. But if that deposit is considered as a non-refundable, of course, you need to make adjustment in your tax on income calculation to uh, compute the tax on that as well. So this is the issue that we uh, normally tax uh, payer are always forget. And another one is the deposit that you uh, paid to your supplier, for example, for the uh, landlord of the lease of the building or something, that uh, that uh, deposit is not refundable and it will be used for to offset with your lease fee, something like that. So at the time that you make payment of that deposit, it's also the time that you need to pay uh, the withholding tax. So uh, this is something that we normally uh, forget. And the, the, the last thing that uh, is also the very uh, common issue that we have seen is the uh, discount, uh, some kind of free item that uh, we as a, a company provided to our customer. So uh, we, we provide the promotion, trade discount, something like that. So the question is around whether VT should be applied before the discount or after the discount. So uh, uh, it is uh, from our experience, it should be um, after the discount, but you need to have uh, some sort of supporting document to support, okay, you have the promotion and some sort of uh, reason why you provide discount to this customer, not to that customer because of what you need to have a policy. Okay, you buy with this amount, you get certain kind of discount, all these kind of things so that it can justify to the tech department. Thank you very much, and uh, I, I, I just uh, I think that that really wraps up our uh, main presentation. But I think the interesting part is just about to start because I've been watching, we've been watching the uh, the questions that come in, and uh, some are really uh, really excellent. Um, uh, I'm going to take them in in in, in order. Um, the the first question uh, is about the um, service fee paid to not VAT registered contractors. Yeah, and somebody is asking the question, well, um, you know, then in that case, we have to pay this withholding tax. Uh, are there cases where that withholding tax is not owed? Uh, I will answer that myself. So for the purchase of goods, yeah, um, we, we don't have this uh, withholding tax. Um, but um, uh, so, uh, but any kind of services, there's really not, there's not really any way around it um, that the withholding tax will uh, will apply. Um, if, I, if I may also ask, uh, yeah. this, this applies to domains overseas, uh, domain registrations uh, using zero accounting system, for instance, Facebook advertising. This all applies as well, on fourteen percent, right? Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, there might be some reductions uh, for, under the DTA. Um, from GDT's perspective, and this was already the case back in, you know, in 2007 when, when I worked there, uh, basically any kind of service would be, also if it's not a technical service or a consulting service, but uh, for example, um, uh, guarantee fees, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, use of software. Uh, software breaks apart into two possibilities. If you look at, if you actually look at the, the license agreement you sign with uh, with the company, with the software provider, you will see that it's mostly written as a royalty fee. Yeah, uh, others are written as a service fee. Uh, so in, in both cases, it's it's a it could be a different rate, but um, but in both cases there is uh, withholding tax. Um, okay, we have a question. I, I think maybe for so that the export commercial invoice can be different from customs value, but customs normally insist to submit the commercial invoice same as the customs value. So uh, so that. Um, um, that 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 may be a possibility, right? That customs want the commercial value, the, the commercial invoice to have the same, uh, to have the same value. If that's the case, we wouldn't see that difference in the accounts that that you discussed. Um, but on the other hand, we also see people using two sets of invoices, right? One may be a pro forma invoice, which is used just for the customs entry process. And then they, they actually kind of replace that one with a definitive invoice, which has the, the, the actual value that are being charged. Um, uh, so that, can you comment? 
Yeah, Edwin, uh, on this one that you are correct that yep, uh, the export invoice you should uh, use it the same as the commercial invoice. So it's no different that, but in some uh, in some export that uh, they use the custom value to show this one. But actually, what I can comment on here is that uh, the the sale that that you should record in your accounting is the based on your commercial invoice because you actually receive uh, the payment also based on your commercial invoice, not the not the export or the custom value. So. The, the the invoice that you should record is the commercial invoice that the one that you send to your customer. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, the next question is about any advances. Um, uh, one of the attend one of the registrants is asking. So, are there any implications for an advance payment that is made by a shareholder but returned within the year? So, it 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 may not show up in the annual financial statements because an advance was given, let's say, in January, and then the money was returned in, in November. Um, but uh, the question is then, does the GDT perceive that as a related party loan and impose interest? Well, it, it is a related party loan. A loan is just another word for uh, 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 using somebody else's money um, and when you have to give it back. Uh, so that is definitely the case. Um, for transfer pricing purposes, you actually need to treat those two companies as if they're completely independent. So you ask yourself, are you able, if you were completely independent, can you get an advance from someone and just give it back uh, a year, almost a year later? Uh, I don't think so. Um, but uh, so if that's the case, uh, yeah, so the answer to that is no, you wouldn't get that. And, and therefore, yeah, this is, this is a related party transaction where you would need um, to prepare yourself with transfer pricing documentation. Um, the next question is asked, uh, uh, does DTA, uh, DTA reduction of withholding tax um, from 14% down to 10%, does that apply also to interest from a related party loan? Uh, the answer is yes, it does. Uh, so DTA reduction does not depend on whether you are uh, related or, or, or not related. Uh, it, uh, it applies anyway. But I, I do remind you that to use the DTA reduction in Cambodia, by the way, that's also the case in Vietnam and in Laos, uh, you cannot self self apply self use the exemption from the DTA. You actually need to ask the GDT first whether you qualify to use the DTA exemption, whether you are correct and you are allowed to using it. Yeah, maybe uh, Villa, do you want to explain a little bit how how that process works? Yes, um, sure, Edwin. Um, so, uh, as Evan mentioned, we need to obtain a pre-approval from the tax department in order to uh, uh, enjoy the benefit of the withholding tax rate reduction. So, the process is that you need to submit the application together with some sort of a uh, uh, document to support like the residency certificate of the uh, company outside the Cambodia, <clears throat> the uh, uh, in certificate of incorporation, all of this kind of thing to the tax department. And the DTA application can be done online now, so you do not need to uh, submit, uh, do it in hard copy or go to the GDT office. You can do it online. So un only until the approval is issued, there is the time that you can uh, uh, apply this uh, reduction. But just yeah. to note that uh, the approval is only valid for one uh, uh, financial year, which means uh, if you get the approval now, the effect is you can do this on behalf of December 2020. So you need to reapply uh, every year. You need to reapply again. Yeah. Thank you, Villa. Um, next question, maybe for Mr. Sodet. Um, Somebody is asking, look, I had a limited audit and I had a related party loan and the limited auditor actually reset a 0% an interest free related party loan. He set that at 3% for tax purposes. Now he is worried he's going to get a comprehensive audit and he is asking in the comprehensive audit, will the, the comprehensive auditor uh, uh, be required to follow the same 3% or, or could, he, uh, could he have a different opinion and put the interest rate uh, higher? Very good question. Yeah, Mr. Very Sodet. Yeah, excellent question. Very good question. Yeah, Mr. Sodet, do you want to address that? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, the question is really interesting that, uh, yeah, whether that the rate that already applied by the limit, it 
whether the comprehensive will, will follow the same. Yeah, actually from 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 the practice to seven zero that also mentioned about the audit procedure about this one that one issue that already uh, audited or reassessed by the the auditor and the department for of course that uh, the other thing cannot uh, to overturn this one that they keep just follow but except it is different it, it is different here that the auditor may think about the again about the, the rate that they need to determine but if it is in the year it should not be uh, they follow the comprehensive should follow the limited audit yeah uh, so comprehensive has to as a principle follow the limited uh, and, and, and i think that should be correct but i will tell you in practice it might we've not had be. cases where uh, the uh, limited audit they decided on a certain rate or on uh, the uh -huh. shareholder loan but the comprehensive overturned it uh -huh. it has happened yeah yeah maybe that's not correct on the auditor's behalf but it has yeah. happened in practice yeah we should we should maybe challenge that yeah yeah, yeah. um there's another question uh, from uh the, the same attendant um we've paid for some entertainment expenses for staff um to uh these are mostly entertainment expenses to take people to dinner to take people to karaoke uh for business development purposes yeah so we we, we try to find a customer we try to find a project okay yeah um do we have to pay fringe benefit tax uh on on that as well if this is not entertainment for the staff but the staff is taking people out uh to to dinner for business purposes um, yeah, I'm not sure who to ask. Um, uh, maybe Villa, do you want to yeah. address that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I've been, um, for this kind of uh, entertainment expense, uh, it, it is not uh, subject to fringe benefit tax because it's uh, for the... It is not, yeah. Yeah, 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 but uh, it is uh, considered as a non-deductible expense when you uh, calculate the tax on income at the end. I see. Yeah, Anthony. Okay. Yeah. So, so in a previous life, before I was uh, AmCham president, I was the Eurocham tax committee chairman, mm -hmm. and we helped prepare the white book and had discussions with the DGT, including uh, the director on entertainment expenses. And I think normally in countries you would expect to have some sort of deduction for entertainment expenses, uh, whether it's um, a percentage of, of a revenue or something, but. The GDT has been very clear on this. Uh, there's going, there's no deduction on entertainment expenses. There's no intent to do that. Uh, the only thing is, if these are excessive expenses, alcohol involved, sort of things like that, then they could be seen uh, as not just entertainment expenses. That's uh, yeah, that's yeah. fringe benefit. Birthday cakes for staff. I mean, these kind of things you have to be careful. Uh, if it's something for your staff where you're giving a benefit or you're having a party for a customer that's over excessive, then it may be seen as fringe benefit. Yeah, yep. Thank you. Um, okay, let's uh, go to the next uh, question. Um, an interesting question also from a transfer pricing perspective. So this, uh, I deduce from the question that this company is, uh, has a related party loan and is trying to justify the interest rate on that related party loan. And they're asking, are we required to use an outside service provider to, for example, prepare a transfer pricing report, or can we just ourselves also prepare some justification for that for that interest rate or for that loan? Um, I, I actually refer back to the to the slide uh, that we discussed, and you see um, that uh, uh, quite a number of the documentation that we recommend are actually internal documents that you can prepare yourself. The board minutes, yeah a business plan showing why your interest rate is, is perhaps a little low or uh, uh, why maybe the interest rate is a little high for that matter. Yeah, a business plan showing this. Um, uh, so the board considering the business plan, the board deciding to go this way or that way. Yeah, um, uh, so these are uh, a proper loan agreement. This loan agreement having a proper date uh, which is fixed uh, so that maybe with a, uh, a, a notarial or a lawyer uh, um, uh, at the station that it is clear that the loan agreement was signed on the date that it says that it was signed. Yeah, uh, so that there is no debate uh, about that. Those are actually documents that you can prepare yourself. Uh, when it comes to the transfer pricing report that you are required to prepare for this, 
I, I actually do not recommend that you that you try and do this yourself um, for um, for the simple reason that uh, to follow proper transfer pricing methodology is actually fairly specialized complicated job. Um, I do not know in any country where it is actually allowed or encouraged to come with your own ideas about this because it is a highly technical uh, uh, method that you need to follow. Um, the, you know, the, the, the training manual that we have on this is, is around 4,000 pages, uh, for example. That is a training manual from OECD, OECD Transfer Pricing Guidelines. Yeah, uh, in, in, in a former life, I wrote a book about transfer pricing in Thailand. You know, that, that's just Thailand. That, that was 400 pages and it didn't even have a transfer pricing law yet. Yeah, so it is a bit complicated and also you need access to data. So you need to have access to 100,000, 50,000 financial data from companies. Uh, so that you can do a TNMM analysis, uh, for example, um, uh, eliminating certain groups of uncomparables, uh, this kind of stuff. So, um, and you know, for nowadays, for uh, to okay, three thousand dollar, you would say it's uh, is it expensive or is it cheap? In the market, is actually quite cost efficient. I don't think you. I think you will spend a lot more man hours doing this yourself and it will be far less convincing when you show it to the GDT, you know, and uh, say that, well, what is this? Did you, did your kid uh, make this uh, on his, uh, uh, for homework, you know, uh, assignment? Yeah. Um, so the whole idea is that when we show them the transfer pricing report, it is persuasive, it is well documented, it is, uh, it has a lot of data there. We explain how we get to these results so that the GDT can have some level in confidence saying that, okay, well, they, they, they did an effort. They actually come up, uh, they, they did look at that data. So I would not uh, uh, recommend that. Okay, next question. Um, what are the tax implications of a transfer of shares of a Cambodian company by a foreign company? Uh, to uh, another foreign company or non-resident. Yeah, yeah I, I think we actually discussed that. Uh, we have a slide about that. So right from the 1st of January uh, 2022, it's quite clear you would pay on the net gain, if there is a net gain, you would pay 14% withholding tax because if there are retained earnings in the company, you know, the, 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 uh, the GDT kind of says, look, you're the shareholder. Yeah, you had $2,000 in that company, $100 capital, $1,900 retained earnings. Guess what? After you sold the shares, what do you have? You have $2,000 cash. That to me is pretty much the same as a dividend distribution. The, the $1,900 that you got out of this, that is profit that comes out of Cambodia. You cannot tell me that that's not Cambodian profit. Yeah, and uh, you ended up as a non as a non resident. You ended up with this two thousand this one thousand nine hundred dollar Cambodian profit in your pocket overseas. To me, that means I have taxing power over that, and I'm going to tax you on this uh, uh, with with this fourteen uh, percent uh, approach. Yeah, so th that that is uh, when it comes to the retained earnings. Yeah, the the other the other attack that they have from the first of Jan. Uh, next year, as uh, Villa explained, that would be to simply look at what is your purchase price and what is your selling price. You set it up way back. You set it up for a hundred dollar capital, right? And now you sell for two thousand. Okay, that's one thousand nine hundred. I'm gonna levy twenty percent capital gain tax on that. So they can use one or the other. Yeah. Uh, what do you prefer to pay? Fourteen percent or two thousand? Yeah. Uh, it it, it de depends depends a bit, but that that would be under uh, under Cambodian. <coughs> Excuse me. So we do have an impact from the DTA on this. So uh, uh, if the DTA applies to the situation, because the seller, the seller, not the buyer, but the seller is is in a DTA country for example, or Singapore or Korea or something like that, then actually most Cambodian DTAs do not allow Cambodia to tax in this situation. Yeah? Uh, the problem is you will need permission from the, GTD, from the GDT to use the DTA. Yeah? 
Um, so that, that may be a bit of a challenge, but we have received this before. Uh, so they're not cynical about it. We did receive permission to do that in exactly this situation. And they knew very well that there was a profit involved. Uh, so um, um, uh, that applies to most of the treaties. But if there's no tax treaty, then uh, Cambodia can tax whatever it wants. One exception is the treaty with Thailand. For some reason, it is the worst DTA we have. <laughs> it's the worst DTA we have. I don't know what happened there. Yeah, um, but um, under the treaty with Thailand, Cambodia has the right to tax anything they like, including capital gains on shares. That is not exempt. Yeah. So the, 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 the best way to invest from Thailand into Cambodia would be to go through another country, actually, from that perspective, and not not uh, direct. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going further. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Villa, a question. Transfer pricing is applicable to whom and it is effective from which date? Well, it is already effective several years, right? Yeah, uh, uh, the transfer pricing rule is applicable to all the uh, company, the tile tech payer that has related party transaction. Uh, th there's no threshold, I mean, to which amount that you should have the report. So uh, as long as you have that one, you need to have a report. And this one was uh, issued in uh, uh, October 2017, but uh, as confirmed from the GDT, you have a report starting from 2018. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, there is a question about business meal expenses. So I think it's kind of the same as we had before. Uh, so if you pay meals, uh, if you pay meals for your staff, then you have a fringe benefit uh, issue. Uh, if you are paying meals for potential customers or customers, that is not a French benefit issue, but you will have, uh, but those meals will not be tax deductible from profit tax perspective. So I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, so there, there was a, uh, a notification out about if everybody uh, received the same benefit, employee meals or employee housing. I think this was meant more for factories, mm -hmm. but there was a notification out from the GDT that you can pay employee meals if everybody gets the same treatment mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. submit a document requesting that uh, those those exemptions. Now, I, I don't want them to know if anybody was ever successful yeah, yeah. in submitting this document to the GDT to yeah. get that uh, treatment. Um, Villa, can you, can you address that? Um, did you catch the question? Yeah, 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 uh, I do, Edwin. Um, thanks, um, Anthony. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, there's a, a notification talking about that, that, that uh, when you provide the meal equally to um, everyone in the uh, company, so it is not considered as a fringe benefit. But uh, there's a, a requirement that you need to uh, submit that policy to the tech department. So um, from our experience, uh, when we uh, submit to the tech department, the, to be honest, there are some company that they can get a feedback from the GDT to uh, confirm, but uh, some uh, submission is silent. So it's, it's more depend on uh, when you, oh, after you submit, you need to have a closely uh, follow up in order to obtain the uh, confirmation from the uh, tech department on that one. Otherwise, it, it will be uh, silent for that. Right, and, and we have received such approvals, right, in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, the next question is about a sure way to avoid um, withholding tax or uh, transfer pricing issues with related party loans. That is, uh, if you have a shareholder loan, don't leave it a shareholder loan, incorporate it in the capital yeah, of the company. That is a 100% sure way. I've done this many times. Um, and uh, uh, there's a question here about how, how that is exactly done. Is there a difference between this and that? Look, the only criterion is whether this amount of capital is set out in your corporate documents as registered with the Ministry of Commerce. So if it is regarded by the Ministry of Commerce of Capital, then it will be accepted by the GDT as capital. You can have different kinds of capital, that's possible. You can, uh, you, you can uh, have different classes of shares. You can issue a different kind of, of share and pay for it, subscribe for that different class of share with the loan that you have already provided to the company. All of that is possible, all of that works. Yeah. What you have to be a little bit careful about, if you have a, a historical shareholder loan, 
let's say it's already on the books, a million dollar for three years. And now we're going to convert it into shares for a million dollar. Uh, then where is the interest over the last three years? Yeah. So you're still going to have that issue. And if you are going to give a little bit more shares to pay for the interest, then that bonus that you're going to pay in, in shares rather than in cash will will be uh, uh, will trigger withholding tax, uh, of course. But but otherwise, you know, it, it works uh, it works perfectly. If you need the money back, yeah, then you will need to reduce the capital. There is a procedure for that. <coughs> There is a procedure for that. Um, it's maybe not as, uh, it's a little bit uh, burdensome when you are a QIP company, because then you need to get CDC approval and practice for all of that. And you don't want to do that every year. Yeah, but, um, but in theory, it definitely works. Um, okay, um, another question, interesting one. In some circumstances, can an individual be both an employee and therefore his salary subject to tax on salary, as well as a service provider? For example, Mr. A is an employee of the company, but they perform some other jobs related to this company outside of his contract in their free time. And in that case, the fee uh, and then a fee is, is paid for that uh, uh, service. Yeah, I, I can tell you we actually have that in, in several, uh, several cases. We try to, for example, when you have an employee here um, that, is, that needs to take care of the, his main task is to take care of the Cambodian business. But he also has a role in Laos and in uh, Myanmar, for example, where he travels from time to time to do different things that are actually for a different company. Then maybe it is better to have him in a different contractual relationship for that time. And uh, we've done that before with other an other labor contract, for example, for the Singapore company, or we've also done that with an independent service provider uh, 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 situation. Um, as a rule, it's perfectly possible legally to have several relationships uh, with the company that have a different uh, legal status. And then on the in, on the service fee, there would be withholding tax rather than tax on salary. Just make sure that both are properly documented and that you have a contract for each of them. And uh, to be safe also, maybe you save some documentation about the reality of his separate service, that his separate service is not just a way to pay him a bonus for being an employee, but that has a, a different scope of work and that he actually has done that scope of work. So in the case where I thought about, I actually we saved the plane tickets and the, the, the stamps leaving Cambodia, uh, entering Laos, coming back, etc., to show that he, that he is really performing a role also outside of his employment contract with Cambodia. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. Um, all right, this is... Uh, a, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry for the... Um, uh, we're a bit over time, so th this is going to be the last question, but we will answer all questions in the chat. We will all, we keep the chat open and we will give you answer to all of it. But uh, we just uh, uh, but we, we, we need to uh, we need to wrap it up soon. Uh, that is a question about the definition of investment capital for determining the priority of the tax holiday. Uh, is it based on the total investment cost or is it based on the share capital uh, amount? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe maybe Sodet uh, or Lysim, do you want to address this? This is a question about what the investment capital for CDC, yeah, for QIP purposes. Is it based on the investment in the shares or is it based on the investment cost, on the, on the, the total price of the investment of the project? Yeah, for, for the, you know, the investment to determine is based on the investment of the project. It's not based on the share that you actually uh, register so you know they only assess on you know how how much to spend on the projects five million ten million so it doesn't uh, uh, that's that's what they uh, uh, you know assess but they don't include land so, yeah. you know, uh, except 
Okay. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Um, one last question. One last question. Okay. A simple one. Yes. From the chat. Not from me. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> from here. All right. One last question. Um, uh, again, a loan agreement. Yeah. Uh, in this case, we prepared a loan agreement with a 5% interest rate, but the GDT doesn't agree with this interest rate. Um, so what would be the normal rate? What would be the other rate that we need to uh, that we need to apply? You know, this is actually something that uh, you cannot really answer in 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 general uh, because it depends on what kind of documentation you can justify. There is no reason why the five percent rate is not acceptable if you have uh, proper evidence to show that between independent parties you would only pay five percent at this particular. Uh, uh, juncture. But it is sure that 5%, I'm, I'm assuming you mean 5% all in, not 5 points over LIBOR. Um, but um, it, it, it is certain that if you compare with the bank loan, it is, it is still a little bit modest. So you, you would need to, but it, it, it depends which currency you're borrowing and where you are borrowing from to try to justify your documentation at, the, at a 5% rate. It, it is a little low from GDT perspective, but actually this needs to be appreciated on a case by case basis. So we, we fight for, for, for every percent. I, I'm gonna ask you to discuss one more thing. Uh, you know, we, we're in the trenches with these auditors. Uh, they, they're just doing their job. Uh, you know, as we look through the years, uh, there were certain hot buttons I remember back with holding tax being one, shareholder loans now being another. I just uh, have seen something uh, new uh, that I was surprised to see on an audit where uh, the auditor assessed on visas and work permits mm. as fringe benefits. As fringe benefit tax. Which is yeah. surprising to me because that has never happened in uh, my 10 years in doing this, mm. where an auditor has said, okay, now all of a sudden, visas and work permits are fringe benefit. My opinion is the cost of doing business mm -hmm. as much as providing a Khmer workbook, mm -hmm. which is uh, something that you have to do with the Ministry of Labor for Khmer employees. Mm -hmm. If it's a requirement by law to have a visa and a requirement by law to have a work permit, how can the GDT possibly say that this is a fringe benefit if the law compels you to have that? Um, it, 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 I understand your argument. Um, so, so that have we pushed back on French benefit tax on visa fees and 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 work permits? I, I guess the GDT's main argument is that the visa is for the individual, uh, and uh, it is not. Uh, it's it, required by law. It, it is issued to the individual, and the work permit is issued to the individual. Um, so that have we have we have we successfully been able to push back on that, or is that something the GDT is uh, is quite uh, quite uh, uh, quite strong about? Yeah, thank you, Edwin. Regarding to the visa fee and and the work permit, yeah, as you explained that the uh, the GDT they try to push that this is the responsible of the employee, not not the employer. So they they, they treat that if the company paid only part, this means that part of the uh, part of the free benefit a uh, free benefit type that we provide to the staff. So of course that that's one that uh, we a little bit that uh, hard to to make the human be that one as from the labor law that of the work permit is responsible by the the employee. So that is the the part that they, uh, they try to yeah. challenge with us. I think part of the problem is that not all employment contracts provide or employment offer letters provide that the employer, it doesn't say explicitly that the employer will bear the cost of the uh, uh, visa and the um, and the work permit. Uh, do you think so that would, would that help if we have a, a contract that actually legally binds the employer to pay this for the employee? It, it shouldn't help huh? because you also have contracts that say that you need to get health insurance and you need to get an apartment for the employee and then it is still subject to FBT. I mean, my only comment on this is that you can't get a work permit without a visa. It's required by the Ministry of Labor to have the visa to get the work permit. So yeah, it makes you, absolutely no sense to... Okay, but you can't live in Cambodia without an apartment either. And, you know, that doesn't mean that it's not a fringe benefit tax. Right? That's not a fringe benefit. Okay. I, th I right? think this was an interesting you, debate, but I, yeah. <laughs> it's required by law to, to stay in the country to have uh, a visa. Uh -huh. 
And it's required by law that if you're a foreigner working in the country, by the Ministry of Labor, it's a law, it's a government fee. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't see it at all as a first matter. Maybe something working group D could take up. I, I think this is going too far, actually, on, on this particular issue. Anyway, let, let, me, let me close up. Do you have a final yeah, comment? No, or? no. Okay. First, let me say uh, what you get out of these is that you should have them more often. I uh, mean, tax is uh, certainly one of the hottest issues in the market. It will continue to be. Uh, so that maybe as a chamber, we can do this more frequently. Um, instead of uh, giving presentations, just have questions and answers maybe. And that's uh, because I think a lot of people have a lot of questions on tax constantly. So let me say a top-notch uh, professional job by BDB Loy. And thank you, Edwin, and your staff. Uh, I can't thank you enough. It was extremely informative. And it's always too short when you deal with taxes. We have tons of questions more that we could have addressed, but we'll do that in the chat. And just in closing, uh, tax, tax is a love-hate relationship. Uh, it's, 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 there's no doubt about it. Uh, people, uh, you know, the tax is a very, very important uh, component of the Treasury. Uh, it's, uh, tax collection is the most important thing for the National Treasury. I think the GDT, uh, at least in the uh, years that I've been involved in tax, has done a phenomenal job. From when, if you remember back when we first started uh, years ago, standardization of tax branches, uh, e-filing, uh, digitalizing the whole filing process, um, which has made it extremely easy. Not taking us out of our jobs as well, because now it's easier to do taxes, uh, so there's less of a dependency on tax agents these days. <laughs> but a great job uh, in, in doing that. Educating the market, I think, uh, to credit of uh, His Excellency Kong Beatball, uh, educating tax tax agents, educating, keeping the market fluid with information, tax forums, the Facebook site, uh, the things that they're doing is absolutely amazing uh, as well. Uh, the estimated regime, putting, getting rid of that and putting yeah, taxpayers in, necessary. And, and unbelievably, you know, putting fair and balance into the tax system. So in, in the, the GDT has done a phenomenal job. Auditors are doing their job. There's no doubt about that. I mean, we all have to follow laws, whether they're traffic laws, curfew laws, social distancing laws these days, wearing masks outside. A lot of people are not happy with these things, but it's it's what it's the law and, and the law of taxation is the law. So we all have to follow that. So tax compliance is very important uh, for the country. Auditors are doing their job. The GDT is doing their job. It's, it's never easy. We all know that. So being clean is very important. Uh, and that's why we're here to, tr to try to educate as well as the GDT to educate the market to be compliant. You're absolutely right. Um, and I would say on the on where, where we could see some more help from the GDT on this. You're absolutely right. A good part of the market still is not tax compliant. There's no doubt about it. But a, but a larger part and continuing larger part of the market is becoming tax it's getting compliant. A lot better. Yeah. And it's good for us as a business, no doubt, because we're providing accounting services, third party uh, bookkeeping services, third party tax services. And that's why we're appointed to make sure that customers are doing the right thing. So I would say on the, on the other side, we would like to see a little bit more uh, understanding from the GDT that if customers are paying professionals to do their books, to do their taxes, to take a less... Uh, it should help. Yes. Yeah, yeah, to take, yeah. to, so, but again, great job by the GDT. Uh, I think uh, congratulations to them for keeping, even now tax collection is still robust, mm -hmm. even in the COVID economy, and we'll continue to work together. Uh, and hopefully when we have, uh, can hold in-person uh, forums that we could have a large tax forum, uh, AmCham could sponsor that soon. But thanks again. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and thank you, Amcham, and uh, until the next time. Keep your questions coming. VDB will answer. Yeah, we will answer all of them in the chat. All right. Have a good day and have a good weekend, everybody. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.